our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. My goal in this deposition was to be truthful, but not particularly helpful. Welcome to Unspun, the podcast that makes you better at finding the truth. The way people get news is changing. It used to be that there were many reporters who would research stories and write articles, but now politicians and famous people share information directly with you on social media and the internet. That means you find out things fast, but it's up to you to make sure the information's actually accurate. And newsmakers don't always do their part. The temptation to manipulate information is strong. They bend the truth to deceive so that they can avoid accountability, so that they can advance their agendas. When you recognize these agendas, you can sometimes find out what's real. And we're at a crossroads where anyone can share anything online. So it's important to sharpen your critical thinking skills. Finding that deception before it goes viral is pretty much a survival skill now. And we're going to do it together. Let's get unspun. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unspun. Welcome to this week's Unspun. The village of Skokie, Illinois, sits outside Chicago, right off I-94 to the northwest. Today, it's a diverse place with a little over a third of the residents being born outside the U.S. Skokie, though small, has been in the news a few times in the past century. It was one of the first places to establish a fine arts commission, for example. But its recognition hasn't always been for good news, and the village has a bit of a gangster history. An FBI poster from the 1930s describes George Babyface Nelson, which was an alias for a criminal named Lester Gillis. The flyer describes him as five foot four, three quarter inches, and with light brown hair and yellow gray eyes. And Babyface, who had connections with the Dillinger crime gang, was himself a serious criminal. He started criming in his early teens, and eventually he fell into robbery, particularly bank robbery. He spent some time named as the FBI's public enemy number one because he had wounded and killed a number of FBI agents. Babyface was mortally wounded in a gun battle with FBI agents right outside of Chicago in the 30s. A co-conspirator drove him to a safe house where he died, and the next day, FBI agents acting on a tip found his body in Skokie, Illinois. But Skokie is also an interesting place legally, as it was one of the landmark cases in interpreting the Constitution's First Amendment. Now. I'm a journalism professor. I have always worked in buildings that literally have the First Amendment written on the wall. Here it is. Congress will make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Five freedoms. In class, sometimes I will give 20 bucks to the student who can come up with all five first. But anyway, we're going to go back to Skokie, and we're going to fast forward to 1977. Skokie has always been kind of a diverse place, it turns out, and one of the major groups who lived there in the 70s were German immigrants. In fact, in 1977, one in six residents of the village had actually survived the Holocaust. At the same time, just down the road in Chicago was the headquarters of the National Socialist Party of America. The National Socialist Party of America, or NSSP, was a spin-off of the National Socialist White People's Party, which had also been known as the American Nazi Party. The NSSP mostly spent its time organizing loud protests against diversifying in white neighborhoods, and this year, in 1977, they announced that they wanted to hold a march through Skokie, Illinois, that place with the one in six Holocaust survivors. The village was not thrilled, and they tried to stop it. They passed a law requiring a $350,000 bond for anyone who wanted to march in town. They also tried a law forbidding anything with swastikas in them on the basis that sharing those kind of materials might lead to violence. And a surprising group helped the Nazis sue, arguing that the village's denial of the permit violated its First Amendment rights. David Goldberger, a Jewish lawyer with the American Civil Liberties Union, defended the Nazis in court, essentially arguing about a logical fallacy. And here it is. Expecting that distributing materials will lead to violence down the road is an example of what we call a slippery slope fallacy, some terrible outcome being predicted by a chain of events that you don't actually know are going to happen. In its defense, the ACLU cited some of the same laws it used before against southern cities that tried to shut down civil rights marches with similar claims about violence and disruption. 
And even the New York Times agreed, writing in an editorial that, quote, the argument that they will provoke violence simply by appearing on the streets of Skokie only emphasizes the obligation of the police to keep peace and gives an opportunity for the people of Skokie to demonstrate their respect for the law. This case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of the Nazis, holding that the village could not prohibit the march simply because it would be offensive to some people. The court found that the First Amendment protects even the most offensive speech, as long as it does not incite immediate lawbreaking. That decision has been cited in numerous cases involving freedom of speech ever since, and it remains an important precedent today. I'm still brand new to Congress. I've only been there 100 days. And I don't know if I'm not supposed to say this out loud, but it's true and important. And if you don't know this, you need to. It's really clear from working there for just a few months that most of the really angry voices in Congress are totally faking it. These people who have built their brands around being perpetually outraged, it's an act. I've seen a bunch of examples. Here's one. I've been in committee meetings that are open to the press and committee meetings that are closed. The same people who act like maniacs during the open meetings are suddenly calm and rational during the closed ones. Why? Because there aren't any cameras in the closed meetings, so their incentives are different. What I've seen is that members of Congress are surrounded by negative incentives. There are rewards for bad behavior. You know what the big one is? Being able to reach you. The big thing that modern media and modern politicians have learned is that if they can keep you angry, they'll hold your attention. And they both want your attention. So if you're a politician and you show certain media outlets that you can help them keep their audience angry, they'll give you their audience. And because so many politicians are willing to play that game, now they're in competition with each other to see how fake angry they can be. So that's real bad. But here's something good. What I love about this... I'm still brand new to Congress. I've only been there 100 days. And I don't know if I'm not supposed to say this out loud, but it's true and important. And if you don't know this, you need to. It's really clear from working there for just a few months that... Most of the really angry voices in Congress are totally faking it. That was a freshman congressman named Jeff Jackson, who has been using social media to reach Americans directly. It's interesting to hear an inside perspective on how Congress works. Representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Dan Crenshaw do some of the same. But for most of us, a look into Congress requires C-SPAN. We've probably all heard of C-SPAN, the public affairs channel that cable companies created as a public service all the way back in the 1970s. But how many of us actually watch it? As a card-carrying Gen Xer myself, I remember when it started up, and I also remember having no interest at all in the content, which seemed to mostly be distant shots of a congressional chamber floor with yay and nay and numbers placed over the top, or some boring person speaking about some boring thing. But I can tell you I pay attention now, and I think a lot of people do, because you can use C-SPAN's website to create your own clips of the interesting bits from just about anything they broadcast. I've done this a few times, and some people nearly make a living doing this either as professional journalists, as citizen journalists, or to use it as some kind of propaganda. And those selections find their way to your eyes and ears on social media. One of the things that C-SPAN broadcasts is congressional committee hearings. So what are committees anyway? Committees are groups of members of Congress who work together on specific issues, and there are three main types of committees. Standing committees, special committees, and joint committees. Standing committees are permanent and deal with the day-to-day -day work of Congress. There are 19 of them in the House of Representatives and 16 in the Senate. Special committees, on the other hand, are temporary and are created to study specific issues. For example, the House Select Committee on the January 6th attack was a special committee that was created to investigate the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Joint committees are made up of members of both the House and the Senate. There are six of them. Why are there so many committees? Well, there's several reasons. Committees let members of Congress focus on specific issues and really become expert in those areas. Experts have an easier time writing legislation. Committees can also let members of Congress follow their interests. If you're interested in education, you can try to get on the Education Committee. If you're a veteran, you can try to get on the Armed Services Committee. When these committees meet, they discuss and debate legislation, they also sometimes hold hearings to gather information from experts and people who are going to be affected by laws they might pass. Once a committee has finished its work, it reports its findings to the full House or Senate. 
and then the full House or Senate will vote on the bill to possibly make it a law. There are also some challenges to having committees in Congress. One challenge is that it can be difficult to get all of the members of a committee to agree on a bill. Another challenge is that committees can be slow to act, and this is because they have to go through a lot of steps before they can report a bill to the full House or Senate. Committees also decide if a bill gets heard at all. Here's how that works. Any member of Congress can introduce a bill. Bills have to get approved by a committee before they go to the full House or Senate for consideration. That committee chair determines which issues are going to be eventually discussed. The speaker will send bills to specific committees, but the chair has the authority to act or not. So that one member of Congress, the one who chairs the committee, can actually kill legislation. Congressional committees also exercise oversight, making sure that the executive and judicial branches are carrying out the will of the people as expressed by bills passed by Congress. Sometimes they'll assign staff to look at a law or policy to make sure it's happening, but sometimes they hold hearings, like the ones that they broadcast on C-SPAN. And this is important. When you have an impotent, divided Congress that can't pass anything, committees become more important to you as a legislator. Committee service is something that a congressperson gets credit for, and they use that credit to build up their brand when they're getting ready to get reelected. If you're in the news because of how you act in a committee hearing, as a committee member or as a chair, it's a way to distinguish yourself, and that is where we get the spectacle of congressional hearings. The present House has a House Committee on the Weaponization of Government, and one of the big topics is censorship. Here's a clip from Committee Chair Jim Jordan's opening statement at one of their hearings. In this country, the government does not get to pick what viewpoints are right, what issues we discuss, or what we believe. But that is exactly what the White House and the agencies as varied as the CDC and the FBI have done. Their censorship has extended to speech on critically important topics, like how best to respond to COVID-19, and even to elections themselves. That kind of speech is at the heart of a free country and our republic. The amount of content censored has been staggering. One nonprofit that is part of the censorship industrial complex has boasted that 35% of the pages it flagged for social media companies were either labeled, removed, or soft blocked. But perhaps even worse is the scope of the censorship. The government no longer pretends that censorship is limited to foreign disinformation or even domestic misinformation. Instead, censorship extends to the so-called malinformation. In other words, true information that is supposedly misleading and conflicts with the censor's preferred narrative. And that is the most dangerous and frankly, the most frightening thing of all. Note how Jordan uses phrases like censorship industrial complex. These are word choices that are intended to make people upset. Let's listen to another example, also from the House. Here, Representative Lauren Boebert is sitting on the House Oversight Committee and questioning some Twitter safety executives. Now, from the hearing that I've been a part of today, um, it's almost impossible to tell where the FBI ends and where Twitter begins. We have Mr. Baker here, a former FBI agent, and there seems to be a revolving door between the FBI and Twitter itself. Um, even Mr. Baker said that there was no collusion with the federal government and Twitter. But Mr. Baker, that's you. You are the collusion between the federal government and the FBI. And now with it, this is such a problem because we're seeing censorship all over. Mr. Roth, Ms. Gaddy, did either of you approve the shadow banning of my account at Lauren Boebert? Yes or no? No, I did not. Not to the best of my recollection. Well, let me refresh your memory because on March 12th, 2021, and Mr. Roth, I know you looked at it because fascist Twitter 1.0 had a public interest exceptions policy, which means for members of Congress to be shadow banned, it had to go before you, Mr. Roth. So I'll ask again, did you shadow ban my account? Yes or no? Again, not to the best of my recollection. So the answer is, Mr. Roth, yes, you did. I found out last night from Twitter staff that you suppressed my account for this tweet. It's a freaking joke about Hillary Clinton being angry that she couldn't rig her election. It's a joke. But in response, being the sinister overlords that you all are, you placed a 90-day account filter so I could not be found. 
And now we see here that Twitter staff said the visibility filter on my account excluded me from top searches, prevented notifications for non-followers, and much more. This is considered an aggressive visibility filter. You silenced members of Congress from communicating with their constituents. You, you silenced me from communicating with the American people over a freaking joke. Again, listen to her words, shadow banning, censorship, the risks of so-called big tech. These have been popular grievances for conservatives since the Trump years. One common way to state that grievance is to talk about violations of the First Amendment. Here in the US, you can use the Constitution as a justification for what you want to happen. Let's say you want to give pistols to preschoolers. You can yell about the Second Amendment. If you want to keep the contents of your cell phone private, you can yell about the Constitution. Do you want your state to decide about something instead of the federal government? You can yell about the Constitution. Do you want to force a business to carry your ideas just the same as everyone else's? Guess what you might want to yell about? You got it, the Constitution. Well, here's the problem. Most of us citizens haven't read through the Constitution. For me, I think maybe there were some lessons on it in the eighth grade, but honestly, it's been a minute. And some of the ideas are hard to understand in a modern context. For example, I don't really see a need for the government to require me to offer housing to a soldier. But guess what? It's in the Constitution. We have a process to select some people who should be qualified to interpret this document in modern times, and we put them on the Supreme Court. But getting those decisions takes a long time for a politician looking to goose their reputation with their base, and so they can get pretty sloppy in describing what the Constitution says. And there aren't really consequences. And so can other newsmakers. Just the word newsmaker can mean two things. People who are talked about in the news and people who create something labeled as news. Now, one response to platforms like Facebook and Twitter removing messages that violate their terms of service has been to create new platforms. Truth Social, linked with former President Trump, is one. And another attempt at a social network was Frank Speech, a project of my pillow CEO, Mike Lindell. Listen here as he describes the need for his network and see where he mentions the First Amendment. All of the cancels were, that our First Amendment rights we're seeing going on right now, well, guess what? It's coming back. You're not going to have to worry about what you're saying and what's going and what, uh, and you're worried about being able to speak out freely. And I do want to say one thing. That we're, when you get in there on Thursday, when you get in there, look at our, I want you to look at our mission statement because we went back and defined, uh, we found from our founding fathers and the Supreme Court and stuff, what defines free speech. So you're not going to have to worry about people if they're on there, you're going to be a good reporting system, but you don't, you don't get to use the four swear words, you know, the, the C word, the N word, the F word, or God's name in vain. Uh, you can't have free speech is not pornography. Free speech isn't, I'm going to kill you. Um, it's very well defined in our mission statement. It's going to be an amazing platform. Lindell had some help forming those beliefs. He hosted a cyber symposium where Harvard law professor Alan Dershowitz weighed in on threats to the First Amendment. Have a listen. We didn't, but we now have the right to look at that. But the more fundamental issue, and the issue that I'm in this case for, the reason I agreed to become a lawyer in this case is because I care deeply about the First Amendment. And the First Amendment today is in great danger. It's in great danger from corporations, from universities. It's in great danger from the social media, from YouTube and from Facebook and from Twitter that are censoring certain points of view and not other points of view. And now we have the court and the government engaged in censorship as well, because the court yesterday put its imprimatur on censorship by allowing this case to go forward. It should never have been allowed to go forward against Mike Lindell and my pillow, because they expressed views which not only in my opinion, but in the opinion of other Eminent constitutional scholars who are with me uh, on the briefs uh, are completely protected by the First Amendment. Even constitutional scholars seem confused. After this break, we'll be talking with a First Amendment lawyer who can help us to cut through the spin. It's been a while since I was in college, but one of the things that we do is require journalism students to take a class in media law. 
And so I'm remembering back to my own class way back in the day. And if I recall correctly, a very important part of the First Amendment is that first word, which is Congress. Congress shall make no law. And so that means that the First Amendment says that the government can't restrict your speech. As I remember, where we get into trouble is that we start equating private companies like social media companies with the government. And I'm not a media law specialist, but fortunately I do work with some smart people. So my guest today is Professor Israel Balderas, who is an assistant professor of journalism with me at Elon University. Israel is not just a professor, but he's also a qualified attorney and an expert in First Amendment law. So I'm really happy to welcome him today. Israel, welcome to Unspun. Thank you for having me here. I am thrilled to be your guest. My first question for you is this, did I remember correctly? Does the First Amendment only apply to the government restricting speech? You would definitely get an A in my class and it is the first issue we cover in uh, media law and ethics uh, in the semester and that is uh, when can you assert your First Amendment rights, right? And it's called the state action doctrine. And basically you said it correctly, right? In order for there to be a violation of your rights, not just the First Amendment, but your Fourth Amendment rights, equal protection under the 14th Amendment, the government has to be involved at some sort, right? Um, it, it doesn't have to be directly, right? It could be, for example, some cases said that the government has so much power over a private entity that therefore the First Amendment does uh, is implicated. But certainly, for example, the hypothetical that I give my students, you know, Kanye West is uh, fired from Adidas for saying horrible things. Can Kanye West sue Adidas for violating his First Amendment rights? And the answer is no. Kanye West cannot under the state action doctrine because Adidas is a private entity and therefore the First Amendment doesn't apply to that corporation. Okay, great. And I just want to point of clarification. Um, when they say the government, is it just the federal government or would that include state governments, local governments, that kind of thing? Everybody from the president all the way to the dog catcher, right? Uh, we have this uh, doctrine also called the incorporation doctrine. And uh, you know, for a majority of the time, right, of US history, the, fir the, the what we call the Bill of Rights has only, um, has only been implicated when the federal government uh, was at issue. Uh, but then the Supreme Court in the 20th century said, started saying that no, you know, the certain Bill of Rights um, you know, do apply at the state level. Uh, certainly some people say that uh, that was reading into the Constitution, uh, but the, the law right now is that yes, the First Amendment does apply to any government entity, whether it's a local college, whether it's a state politician, or whether it's a federal government. So would that explain in the Skokie case that I talked about before how it was the local government action that still kind of triggered First Amendment concerns? That's correct. Now I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into these weaponization of the government hearings. Mm. Um, they've been on the news a lot and they do seem like they're focusing on these free speech issues right now. But I think their argument is interesting. So what they're arguing is not that the government is directly influencing speech, but they're applying pressure to platforms like Twitter and YouTube to get them to make certain content less prominent or to ban certain accounts. So first of all, is a company like Twitter required to carry accounts for people in political office? Do they have a right to restrict or deplatform politicians? Uh, the, the answer to that is always right now, it depends. Uh, and the reason I say it depends is because Everywhere else but in Texas, the answer is yes. The, 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 the social media platform can restrict speech under their terms and agreement, right? Uh, then there's the outlier. And Texas passed a law called SB8 in which they said that um, private companies like Twitter, they couldn't censor uh, speech based on the content. Um, that bill, that legislation now has gone up to the Fifth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit said, correct, uh, Texas can uh, demand that social media platforms must carry and that they cannot censor any kind of speaker. The same law was passed in Florida, except in that case, the Eleventh Circuit said, no, that is unconstitutional because that is, uh, you know, mandating speech. And, uh, and that, of course, the Supreme Court has said, you can't do that. Those two cases uh, are now pending before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court hasn't granted cert yet, but most likely they will in the 23-24 term. So right now, as it stands, social media platforms do not have to carry the specific users, but in Texas, they would. So for those of us who don't remember back to media law in 1989, what does granted cert mean? So grant cert means the Supreme Court has agreed to hear the case. 
Uh, and so, for example, in that case, we would say there's a, a split in the circuit court, right? The Fifth Circuit, where Texas lies, they've decided uh, the question of whether or not governments can force social media to have to carry speech. Um, the Fifth Circuit has said yes. The Eleventh Circuit, which is where Florida sits, they have said no. And when you have that kind of split decision, eventually that case is going to go to the Supreme Court, right? Because we always say the Supreme Court uh, has the last word. And, and so when they grant cert, it's, it's called a grant of certiari, uh, cert for short, and that means that the court will hear the argument sometime in the fall or the spring of 23 to 24. Okay. I think I understand now. Um, so here's a little bit more technical of a question. Some lawmakers in these hearings have been referring to something called Section 230. So what is that and how might that apply in these accusations of censorship? Sure. So Section 230 comes from the, the, the terminology of, of the law, right? Section 230 of what we call the Communication Decency Act, the Communication Decency Act was a piece of legislation that was passed under the 1996 um, uh, C Communications Act. And so just to kind of think about it, right? In 1996, we didn't have the internet. And yet when Congress passed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, they were looking ahead to what would be the internet, right? They called it information services. And within the Telecom Act of 1996, there was this section called, uh, first there was this idea of, of decency. What would be allowed on the internet? Could the government, for example, regulate content that it finds um, uh, quite offensive? Obscenity, for example, on the internet. Could the government regulate obscenity? And that case went to the Supreme Court and in Reno versus the ACLU, the Supreme Court said, no, the government cannot regulate the internet. Um, they thought back then that the internet would be this vibrant community where all speech would be allowed, even if it was speech that would be offensive like obscenity. Looking back now, one could argue that that was a bad decision. We now have 20, 25 years of data that shows that easy access to pornography on the internet has harmed, uh, especially young people, right? So that's one aspect of, of, of uh, the law that impacted the internet. Sub a subsection of the Communication Decency Act was Section 230. And uh, they've called Section 230 the 26 words that created the internet. And what it basically said was that any interactive service, a website, email, um, that would not be responsible for the posting of comments by a third party, right? So it's protection from liability for the comments that people place. Um, you know, somebody posting a comment on a news story on the Washington Post. Uh, the Washington Post can't be sued even if the comment, for example, is defamatory. Um, that type of protection created Facebook, created Twitter, created Instagram. And if I were to go and post uh, on Twitter, you know, Amanda Sturgill is mean and that, you know, ruined your reputation. Uh, you might think, well, I'm going to sue Twitter because after all, they allowed that, uh, that false, you know, uh, defamatory comment by Israel to, to be posted. Section 230 protects Twitter from that type of liability. You can sue me, but I have no money. And that's what Section 230 does. However, that law uh, is now before the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, um, the Supreme Court heard two cases in February and in March. One of the cases is called Gonzalez versus Google. The other case is called Twitter versus Tamney. In those uh, cases, it involved uh, families that are suing either Google or Twitter because the algorithms on that social media allowed videos to go high in the posting. And so therefore the family sued the social media companies because some of these videos, some of these postings, uh, they did damage to the families. And so that, that there's, that's, a, that's a tort claim. But the question is, can Google and Twitter rely on Section 230 to protect them from liability? And that the Supreme Court is going to answer by the end of this term. Okay, that should be interesting to see. Well, it, it certainly will be, because a lot of people have said, if the Supreme Court were to remove liability protection, or let's say they were to say Section 230 protects, but it doesn't protect as much as it has over the last 20 years, 
Some argue that it would start to chill speech on social media platform, right? Uh, social media platforms would have to regulate more speech uh, than they are comfortable doing. And so therefore, by regulating speech, would that be a violation of the First Amendment, right? So there's one group of people that argue that. The other group of people that argue is that, well, you're not gonna have as vibrant of a community on social media as you have right now. Anybody that's on Twitter, anybody who's on social media could then turn around and say, yeah, but it's not as vibrant, right? There's a lot of bad speech out there. So maybe it is time for uh, social media to sort of start living within the boundaries of what we would say is the wider society, right? For example, you could say something on social media right now that could ruin someone's reputation, but if you're an anonymous poster, you don't suffer the consequences of that. Yeah, but I think it's important to know that there's a difference here, right? Because right now, social media platforms can choose to restrict some speech as private companies. They could. Right, and so what we're talking about here is if we change the law, then they might be required to either not restrict or restrict some speech, depending on how the law went. That's correct, because they'd be afraid of, of being sued. Okay. Because then they, now they would be responsible for that speech that is published on their platforms. Okay. Um, and in a way that feels to me like back when we used to have landlines for phones, it would be like being able to sue the phone company for something someone said in a phone call. Right. Which would be interesting and complicated. Okay, anyway. So one of the things that has um, come up in these weaponization committee hearings is this notion that it's not so much that um, the government is directly restricting people's speech, but that it's leaning on companies to do mm -hmm. it, right? So the companies have the right to um, restrict the speech in any way that they choose. They can have terms of service, for example, and if you violate those, they can deplatform you. Um, if it is true that the government is encouraging companies to restrict certain kinds of speech, could that be a First Amendment violation? Some would argue, yes, that at that point, uh, the government is definitely exercising power and control uh, and you know, forcing uh, private companies to have to carry speech that it doesn't want, that as a private entity, for example, it could exclude. But if the government now is putting pressure, one could argue that at that point, then you know, there is a symbiotic relationship between the government and the private entity. Yeah, but we're kind of seeing the opposite being argued, right? That the government's putting pressure on the private entity to not carry certain kinds of speech, right? So like uh, shadow banning Congress people. Sure, and, and that's the thing, right? It becomes a which government is, is in power. Uh, certainly if a Democratic governor or president uh, doesn't want you know, some kind of speech that it finds offensive, that it finds hurtful, that could be problematic. On, on the other hand, if you have a Republican president, right, they don't want to have news that embarrasses them, so they could put pressure on that. It becomes uh, a situation where social media entities are caught in the middle, right? And it's all gonna depend on which government is responsible because the government on the right is going to try to go after government on the left or government that um, you know makes a mockery of them or as they claim ruin their reputations, government on the left could say, look, we don't, we don't want speech that hurts, that offends, that is hateful. And so therefore it becomes governments that are regulating based on their own particularities. So it seems to me that with this and other issues of free expression, that it's a case to be careful what you wish for. Because if you make changes when you're in power, you may not be happy with those same changes when you're not in power anymore. That's right. Right. So we do have a few listener questions, if you're willing. The first one they asked, where does you're entitled to your own opinion but not your own facts fit in with the First Amendment? And is it different when it's just an ordinary person or whether it's someone in a position to provide accurate information? So I would rephrase that as, is misinformation still protected speech? Yeah, uh, so there's a case on point, uh, Alvarez versus the US, and this was an idea of can a person lie and, and be arrested for the lie, and Alvarez uh, there was an individual who was lying about the medals that they had uh, that they had received, right? Ma uh, medals of valor, and there was a law specifically that said that look, you can go after someone, you can arrest them if they lie about whether or not they're recipients of these, you know, military medals. And the Supreme Court said, you know, a lie is still protected under the First Amendment. Uh, you can't punish someone for lying broaden that to what we have now, and that is individuals who sometimes in some senses are, are intently doing you know, misinformation, sometimes disinformation, right, purposefully. 
And the argument would be, well, could the government ban that information? And I think back to COVID and 2020, for example, when in 2020 people said, well, you know, you, you, you shouldn't wear masks uh, because it's not going to be helpful. And then the government changed and said, you must wear masks. And then there were people who said, well, wait a minute, the science is not there because it depends on what kind of mask, right? And so in that point, what was misinformation? What, what information did the government deem that was, was necessary to say it's misinformation? Um, you know, I think of, for example, the idea of my body, my right. Pre-COVID, we would have said, oh, that's someone who is maybe uh, advocating for pro-choice policy. Nowadays, my body, my right may be for somebody who's advocating for no vaccines, right? Um, and so therefore, we want to be careful when the government takes sides on these questions of, of information. And, and we call it the uh, neutrality viewpoint. That is, the government should always take a position that it doesn't, it doesn't take one side or the other and as to the value of the speech. And so to deem something misinformation, it would mean that the government would step in and say, we find that this piece of information is misinformation. Great, all right, one more listener question. I see people use the example of someone yelling fire in the theater to show unprotected speech. I read another legal take that said it's not that simple. So where does it cross from freedom of speech to incitement? Does it ever cross from freedom of speech to incitement? There is, you know, uh, 50 something, 19 to 1970, so 60, 60 plus years. The Supreme Court did eventually overturn the clear and present danger test uh, cited in Shank versus Abrams in a case called Brandenburg versus Ohio. It's called the incitement uh, to violence test. And in that case, it involved KKK members who um, were you know, gathering and they had called a, a news station to come and videotape their, their gathering, right? Their burning of the cross. And, and uh, they claimed that they wanted to take revenge on the government and they were arrested for, you know, in, you know, for clear and present danger. And the Supreme Court overturned the clear and present danger test and developed what is now called incitement to violence. It's a two-part test, right? And that is, is the individual, does the individual have the intent to produce, right, the violent or, um, or you know, illegal acts? And is it, is it likely to do so, right, imminent uh, action? And so it's not a hypothetical, uh, but the situation that I point to is Donald Trump on January 6th of 2021, where he is speaking in front of the White House and he is telling his, his supporters, uh, we are going to march down to Capitol Hill and we're gonna give those people a piece of our mind. And of course, what happened? Insurrection actually happened on Capitol Hill that day. And I asked my students, you have to argue for both why Donald Trump did incite violence under that two-part Brandenburg test, and you have to argue why he didn't, using his speech, right, using his words. And of course, students always find a reason why he is uh, guilty of incitement to violence. My students have a harder time <laughs> defending that his speech did not incite violence. But one could argue that that is a good example where did he have the intent to, to have the violent action that he was promoting, right? We're gonna march on, Cap, on Capitol Hill. Well, a lot of people always say, we're gonna march on Washington. So that's not necessarily violent action. We're gonna take Capitol Hill. Well, that could be hyperbolic, but certainly everything else that he was saying that you know we're gonna give him a piece of our minds, one could argue that he had the intent to commit violent acts against Congress. Did it happen? Did it happen immediately uh, at that point? Yeah, we're gonna march right now. And so the Brandenburg test is that, uh, what I call that exception to the First Amendment, that it's the emergency principle. And if there's an emergency principle, this is words that cause emergency, incitement to violence. Therefore, it's not constitutionally protected. Thanks to my guest Israel Balderas for being on Spun this week. The First Amendment ensures us freedoms, but it's up to us to protect it. And before we can protect it, we need to understand it. And so do our lawmakers. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your hitting the subscribe button or leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. That helps get Unspun in front of more people. Talk to you soon. Thanks for getting Unspun with me this week. Unspun is a production of me, Amanda Sturgill and is a proud member of the MSW Media family of podcasts. 
Send me your thoughts and ideas about trickery in the news on Gmail at theunspunpodcast at gmail.com. I even write back. And find this episode's show notes and more information at theunspunpodcast.substack.com. Want to learn more and get smarter? Check out my book, Detecting Deception, Tools to Fight Fake News, which is available on Amazon or your favorite online bookseller. And until next time, stay sharp, everyone.